changing Hollywood with a bang. The Hurt Locker wins Best Picture at the Oscars, and its director is the first woman to win the top award. But what are the politics behind the success, and how does the film industry reflect or shape the real world? This is Inside Story. Hello there, warm welcome to the program. I'm Shuli Ghosh. The 82nd Academy Awards in Los Angeles was, as ever, the scene of both surprises and predictability. Most of the odds on favourites took the major awards with victories for Jeff Bridges and Sandra Bullock in the best acting categories. But the real drama of the night was over best picture. James Cameron's mammoth blockbuster Avatar was tipped by many to sweep the floor with its rivals. But in a David and Goliath moment, it was the low-budget war movie, The Hurt Locker, that took the most prestigious awards of the night. Set in Iraq, the film follows a team of bomb disposal experts. It's made around $22 million at the box office, compared with Avatar's massive $2.5 billion. It also cost a fraction of Avatar's production budget, but while Avatar won three awards, including Best Visual Effects, The Hurt Locker took six Oscars, among them Best Picture, and Best Director for Catherine Bigelow, the first woman in Academy Award history to take the prize. And I'd just like to dedicate this to the women and men um, in the military who risk their lives on a daily basis in Iraq and Afghanistan and around the world, and may they come home safe. Thank you. So, what are the politics behind the big screen? Let's introduce today's guests. In Washington, D.C., we have M.J. Rosenberg, a senior foreign policy fellow at Media Matters Action Network. In London, we have Richard Fitzwilliams, a film critic and former editor of International Who's Who. Also in London, Michael Bonner, the associate editor of Uncut magazine. Gentlemen, welcome to the programme. Uh, Richard, let's start with you in London. Why The Hurt Locker? Is it a, a brilliant film or a political choice or both? Well, I think it is one of the finest war films that uh, I've seen. And why The Hurt Locker? Well, take the direction, for example. Uh, first, you had to care about the characters. Now, throughout that film, I didn't feel Jeremy Renner, who, of course, was nominated as Best Actor, and Anthony Mackie, incidentally, should have been nominated as Best Supporting Actor as, as two out of the three of this bomb disposal oh, squad. Yeah. I didn't feel I was watching actors. I felt they were who they were. Insofar as this film could, so it projected you into the most extraordinary situations as they go about defusing bombs in the streets and parts of Baghdad. But are any Equally, messages about the Iraq war or is this simply about the heroism of, of US soldiers? It shows the hell of it. It shows the horror of it. There's no question that this is a, not a movie that in any way whitewashes war, quite the contrary. On the other hand, it does show the courage of those who uh, save lives, lives on both sides. There's one extraordinary scene where there's a, a suicide bomber, someone who's been forced to be one, and uh, Staff Sergeant James, uh, who's played by Jeremy Renner, tries to help him. And this is an absolutely knife-edge moment. The important point to make about this movie is that the, insofar as you can be, you're on the edge of your seat. Whether it's a bomb that's being looked for in a car and that car has to be ripped to bits, or whether perhaps you're standing in the center of what turns out to be no less than seven bombs, as Jeremy Renner's character is in uh, this situation on one occasion, or in a prolonged scene, because the scenes take their time. This is the important thing, I think, about Bigelow's direction. She draws you in and then, in a sense, you do suffer, you also are involved. And the desert sequence is extraordinary because snipers uh, shoot three English mercenaries and uh, they are subsequently themselves uh, shot at. And it is atmospheric, 
It has a realistic mood, but it doesn't preach at you. We've seen so many films uh, dealing with uh, most particularly Iraq, but also Afghanistan, and whether it's redacted or uh, rendition, whether it was Lions for Lambs or even Battle for Haditha. Some of them were good, some not. But they had messages and they lacked conviction. This, I realized that I was being involved in it, that it was an extraordinarily tense film, that it was a deeply genuine film which was photographed in the most extraordinary way. Uh, the uh, camera work, Oscar, went to Avatar. This was one of the moments of the night where I felt Barry Aykroyd really should have won. There's this amazing handheld photography. Well, let's bring, uh, uh, hand let's bring Mike in because I, I read your predictions before um, before the Oscars <laughs> oh, and yeah. I know <laughs> you really didn't expect the Hurt Locker to win, did you? I, I mean, I wanted it to. I think you know the caveat on that particular blog was that I uh, I wanted it to, but um, you know I kind of felt at that point that the cumulative you know weight of of Avatar looked you know very likely to uh, to, to prove unstoppable. I mean, I think um, you know it's interesting the point Richard just made um, about the Hurt Locker and how you classify it as a war film because. It is a war film, but you know it doesn't at any point address the you know the geopolitics of of Iraq. I mean, it, it reminds me more perhaps of of the kind of films that Howard Hawks or, or or Walter Hill would make, which became studies of uh, of men in uh, extraordinary situations, and they were very much defined by their response to those situations. Do you which think is that was one of the with, problems with, with Avatars that, that right wingers felt it was preaching against uh, the Iraq incursion or, or any yeah, U.S. influence in, a, in yeah. another country? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that there is superficially, uh, you know, a sort of left wing agenda there, in as much as, you know, the white technocratic oppressive forces are up against the you know uh, spiritual indigenous natives who are who are who are in touch with uh, you know with the planet um, and it, it kind of reminded me a little bit uh, to some extent of of revisionist westerns from the 70s like Ozana's raid um, but um, I think that Avatar ultimately you know was so befuddled once you got past the initial and very spectacular immersion into into Cameron's 3D world, I think it, it, it became very kind of muddled, very superficial in, in the way that it addressed its politics. Uh, MJ, do you, do you agree that there may have been, um, um, amongst the Academy judges at least, some kind of backlash against Avatar, A, for all the CGI that it has in it, uh, and B, because uh, it did have a message which was about uh, the ill-advised uh, incursion of a, of a, uh, of a more um, technological culture on a more primitive one. Well, I, um, I saw Avatar as a very political film. Um, when I walked out of the uh, theater, I, I, I was trying to figure out which, who were these indigenous people? Who did Cameron have in mind? Immediately, you know, I thought, well, it's obviously, to my mind, the American Indians, maybe it's the um, Palestinians. Um, well, I had all these different. Why does he have to have uh, anyone in mind? Why can't he just make a jolly good movie about um, a bunch of blue people? Why does it have to be a message? Well, actually, actually, he said uh, in this week's Time magazine that came out yesterday, when he was asked he, if it was the American Indians, he said that it was, and he said, but don't forget about the indigenous people of Brazil with their forests being destroyed. Ah. I think he clearly had a political agenda in mind. I don't think, though, that would have had any backlash with the Academy, because the Academy is very liberal, even left-wing, particularly the newer voters who, may, you, know, you get to be a voter by you know, by working on a, a by working on a film that gets nominated, all these independent films produce all these extra voters, and these are younger people. And uh, I would think more. Uh, no, I think we know that Hollywood is very very liberal and pretty anti-war. Um, I think that you know, in, in a way, the Hurt Locker, 
the Avatar is a more traditional war movie in a way, to a certain extent. There's the good guys who are the indigenous people, and there are the, the bad guys who look like Americans and are sort of are Americans. Hurt Locker, there's no, they're, they're, the, the soldiers are the good guys, but there's no country that is the good guys. It's not a traditional war film at all in that you identify with the soldiers, but not with any particular yes, cause. Yes, that, don't you think? Far stronger, uh, absolutely. I felt, for the point you've just made. So, Absolutely. Richard, no I mean, do, did that, you agree that, that, that movies have to have messages? They can't just be entertaining? Of course they can be entertaining, and uh, you needn't have a, a larger purpose. I mean, I suppose technically Titanic was uh, entertaining, uh, the special effects were, but the script, I thought, was so wooden that I'm surprised the cast didn't float away to uh, safety on it. <laughs> I mean, I'm afraid that uh, the, the entertainment in itself was what I think most people got out of Avatar because you were drawn into this wonderful magic world of the planet Pandora and its fauna and flora and its mountains and its extraordinary flying beasts and so on. It, it's that side well, of it that I enjoyed I saw the 3D version and I have to say I felt a bit seasick uh, after a while. <laughs> yes, but don't you think it's wrong that some cinemas are showing it in uh, 2D and, uh, you know, it loses, uh, it loses its charm, and I suspect, if it's seen in that way. I mean, I think that the political message, the eco-friendly message most particularly, this was what uh, struck me, was that what Cameron was trying to get across, and I think that that's very much in tune with what he expected and the Oscars uh, would endorse, because Hollywood loves liberal issues. I mean, that will never change. But I also think that there were certain factors that could perhaps have worked against Avatar. We mentioned the fact that the Academy has a traditional side and that the computer-generated aspect of it might not have played for the movie. But also, there are certain types of movies that Oscar just doesn't fancy. We only two thrillers, three westerns, uh, six musicals and eight comedies have ever won, and no science fiction movie, and I don't yeah, the Lord Oscars the don't Rings, really Return like sci-fi, do they? I mean, uh, Star Wars uh, missed out, E.T. missed out. Um, You're right. They're the only two who've got nominations. And uh, Space Odyssey, 2001, the Space Odyssey was the great one. Uh, won Kubrick's only Oscar, but uh, wasn't nominated for Best Picture. So you're right, again, there was that aspect to it. And I also suspect if you look at the ten films, and remember this new preferential voting system, and people voting one to ten, it was rather complicated, but... Avatar did polarise quite a few people, almost everybody. I mean, everyone today has been very admiring of what the Hurt Locker had to offer and also the insight it gave us into the human condition, which I think is so important. Well, let's, let's talk about... Uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to also talk about the, the, the people, the individuals at uh, the Oscars um, uh, rewards. Uh, for example, the fact that Catherine Bigelow is the first woman to win uh, Best Director. Uh, also, um, this side of it, the, uh, the Best Supporting Actress, in her acceptance speech, um, Monique, who won the Best Supporting Actress, uh, paid tribute to black actors who'd come before her. This is what she had to say. First, I would like to thank the Academy for showing that it can be about the performance and not the politics. I want to thank Miss Hattie McDaniel for enduring all that she had to so that I would not have to. Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey, because you touched it, the whole world saw it. Mike, um, uh, uh, Monique was uh, referring to Hattie McDaniel there, of course, the, the first black person ever to win an Oscar, and she did so in 1939. How far do the Oscars uh, push um, progress uh, in, in the wider world? That's a very... I don't, I don't know entirely uh, how to address that. I mean, I think that... But do they uh, reflect the changes refle or do they shape changes? I think they reflect rather than shape. I w I'd, I'd never necessarily consider the Oscars to be uh, remotely groundbreaking in that respect. I mean, the simple fact that it's taken this long to, to you know, to give a, a, a woman the best, you know, director Oscar, uh, 
you know, it strikes me as being as being very uh, very reactive rather than uh, rather than uh, groundbreaking. I mean, the fact that that Catherine Bigelow became the first woman to win Best Director. I mean, that that's clearly being hyped up as a, a very significant moment. Uh, Clearly, she deserves it, and she's extremely good at her job. But is there also a feeling that it was time? Um, perhaps. I, I mean, uh, you know, I've been a big fan of Catherine Bigelow for, for many years, and I, and I wish she'd won an Oscar for, for, for a couple of films previously. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's you know, it's the, the best film out there. It's the best director of the best film out there, rather than... Um, a decision based perhaps on 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 you know gender or or, or or color or creed what do you think mj do you agree with that i i wonder and I, of course there's no way of knowing if the in the minds of the academy the decision had been made that they wanted to honor catherine bigelow this year both for her achievement and because a woman has never gotten that particular award once that's assumed you almost have to go with her picture as being the best film. They rarely split the two. Best director makes the best picture. So I think that that whole dynamic really, really um, played to her advantage. Hollywood is very slow. You know, when you think back, it was only in, in 19, I think it was 1967, one of you can correct, correct me, that um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, starring Sidney Poitier as the um, black man who marries Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy's beautiful white daughter. It was hugely controversial, and, I mean, it was, it was like a... And the Sidney Poitier character, if he resembled anyone in real life as being utterly perfect, he was like Barack Obama. He was like a black man who was like... He was a physicist, he was a Nobel Prize winner, he was a he man was a genius. anyone would want to marry their daughter. <laughs> exactly, and yet the whole film was about could they... And could we, the audience, accept him? And the answer and won the, the awards, but it was like, it seemed by then, so, you know, the civil rights movement was, had already crested by that point. And yet Hollywood was still asking the question, could a white family accept the most perfect black man who ever lived? Well, hold, that, hold that though, MJ, because I want to throw something else sure. into it. Joel and Ethan Cohen's latest film, A Serious Man, is about a Jewish professor, and asked what their response was to those who claim the film is anti-Semitic. Joel Cohen said, we don't really care because it's just a given. When you get specific about a religion or even a region, somebody's going to get offended. Uh, MJ, do filmmakers sometimes play devil's advocate? Well, I think that the Cohen brothers, you know, I, I think the Cohen brothers are Jewish themselves. The film is about childhood <laughs> to a large extent. It's about their it's, it's about their lives in Minnesota. And I think that they wanted to do a, a film that was about people like them. I was, it was not only... it was. I mean, I, this Abe Foxman, who is the kind of very right-wing head of the Anti-Defamation League, which is a kind of, you know right-wing Jewish group, he said these films aren't anti-Semitic. You can't produce, you can't portray a minority group as having all its members being good people, because that's not true of any group, and therefore that becomes a form of bias itself. So I don't think it's an agenda. Think, it's just reality. Oh. Go on, Richard. I was wondering on the issue of homophobia, the famous occasion when Crash suddenly came from, I thought, pretty well nowhere and beat Brokeback Mountain. There were a lot of people who felt that Brokeback Mountain was by far the better picture and that older voters and possibly homophobia had uh, influenced the voting and I wondered what you thought. I absolutely agree with that. In fact, I have to say, I was so outraged by that that I, I, my protest was not watching the show the following year. <laughs> I mean, Crash I is not a memorable... Yeah, Crash was not a memorable I, movie at all. It's an insignificant film, and Brokeback Mountain will be is is a is a classic. I have to say, yes, that, it, it is a classic. Uh, and a lot of the winning films over the past few years have been quite grim, haven't they? I mean, uh, Hurt Locker, No Country for Old Men, The Departed, Crash, Million Dollar Baby. What is that about, uh, Mike? Is there something going on here? We we like uh, particularly American audiences like to be depressed. I, I no, I, I think on the, on the contrary. But I mean, I think, you know, we've been in in uh, in an era over the last uh, six or seven years where a number of significant films have come out which 
perhaps have their their kind of cultural origins um, in uh, a different era of filmmaking, kind of 70s era of filmmaking, that kind of cinema of, uh, of conscience um, that, uh, that you associate, you know, with filmmakers like Scorsese and, uh, and uh, what you've got with that slew of movies is a throwback to, to a kind of more, more question, questing, more provocative type of filmmaking that I think, because the Academy I th are very liberal because they like to perhaps hold up that golden age of, of movie making as being uh, you know the pantheon that they respond uh, very positively to movies that, that, that they kind of see as being in that mold which I think probably accounts for the success certainly of things like No Country for Old Men uh, which wouldn't have looked out of place as being you know a Sam Peckinpah film from the mm. mid-70s um, or, or I mean, there is, there is baby. some talk uh, that uh, some analysts say in America there's been a culture of fear um, which has been propagated by the Bush administration after 9-11 and that's being reflected in Hollywood. Do you not agree with that? Maybe. Um, I, 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 I think that, that a, a culture of fear uh, existing in Hollywood, you mean among filmmakers? Among filmmakers? Yeah, do you, how do you mean that, that sorry, I, I, maybe I missed. Well, what I'm asking is question, whether, but, but whether Hollywood is simply reflecting the sort of unrelenting um, uh, pessimism uh, in, in society, which, which has followed from 9-11. Uh, it, it's not my yeah, I mean, thought. I, I, uh, this is something that analysts well, have, have put forward. Yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. No, I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, that, that culturally artists are, you know, in tune creatively with things that are, you know, are in the air, are, are you know, currents in the air, and that is reflective certainly in, in 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 films, and that ultimately is reflected to some degree, lesser or greater degree, with with the Oscars. So certainly, I think people respond creatively to incidents like 9/11 or the War on Terror, or you know, going back to the Vietnam or uh, war or or wherever you want to. You know, place it, um, and so I it's inevitable Hollywood, that at some point that's going to come through. I thought Hollywood. Well, I think the took a very long time. Sorry, Holly Richard, go so on. Hollywood, Hollywood took a very long time, of course, to come to terms, even to make films about the Vietnam War, because of course, Mash was um, ostensibly about. It was set in Korea. It was obviously about Vietnam, but we had to wait till the deer hunter years later. And at least they've made quite a large number of films dealing with the various issues involved, including and it's Charlie interesting. Wilson's War. I, I see that there, there was a whole rash. Mm. There's been a whole rash of uh, Vietnam War films, and then a bit later on, you get a whole rash of uh, Africa films, Rwandan genocide films. They all seem to come along in, in no clumps. Less than a whole series, yes, they do, and then we've had a whole series. One of the problems, though, of movies, and this could have motivated, or this could have played against the Hurt Locker. Almost every film made about uh, Iraq or Afghanistan seemed to bomb at the box office. A movie that, whether it was A Mighty Heart or whether it was Lions for Lambs, I mean, these films did it extremely badly. And Hurt Locker costing $11 million, the amazing way that this was made and also I think we should pay tribute to Mark Bowl, the screenwriter who of course spent time with the bomb disposal unit and he knew what he was talking about and he'd written the script for In the Valley of Ella which featured an amazing performance which was uh, nominated uh, for best picture, uh, best uh, actor um, by Tommy Lee Jones. I mean that was I think noticeable and I do think that this is an important aspect of uh, filmmaking. I mean I don't think Hollywood is ever in influenced by the likes of the Bush administration other than to wish to tear it down. It's very difficult to find a Republican in Hollywood with the rarest of exceptions. You have to search on the website to find lists of those actors who are supposedly sympathetic. But I do think liberal think issues are very much at the, uh, uh, the very close to the Academy's heart. OK, uh, we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for a very entertaining discussion. Uh, MJ Rosenberg, Richard Fitzwilliams and Michael Bonner. And thank you at home for watching. If you want to say something about today's show, email us on InsideStory at aljazeera.net. Until next time, from me, Shuli Ghosh, bye-bye.